have a question for you. Are you ready for the 2019 Ready Man Art and Science Fair? Uh, it turns out that's good because that's exactly what this is. Yeah. And uh, my name is Dylan Sisson. And the talk, uh, my name of my talk is This is Not a Toy uh, because it's a production render. So. Um, I just wanted to say that I think this is the greatest event in visual effects at the Novo Theater tonight because we are at SIGGRAPH and there's great visual effects going on all week long. So, so. So SIGGRAPH is great. Apparently the theme is Thrive. Don't know about you, but uh, I'm thriving. So, yeah. And, and we have a great show for you tonight. At least, I, I hope it is. And I'm going to start with Toy Story 4. Um, yeah, the, the first, uh, or the, the fourth movie in the Toy Story trilogy. We used RenderMan to render this movie. And I have some fun facts from the film that I would like to share with you tonight. And I have actually four fun facts and one ugly one. So um, to start off, the first fun fact, Here's a carnival from Toy Story 4. How many people have seen Toy Story 4? Woo! Okay. okay. How many people haven't? <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's a story about toys. In the carnival scene, there's lots of little tiny lights. A lot of these are little bulbs or miss of geometry. And if you count them all up, there's over 17,000 lights. And these lights, uh, um, three percent of these lights are um, no good. They're, they've burnt out. Just for added realism, because that's how how well they maintain this carnival. <laughs> um, but each light was calibrated relative to all the other lights in the entire show, including that light in the side, the sky called the sun. So we would use scene wide exposures to get added realism. So that's pretty cool and seems complicated, but if you went inside the antique mall, you would find that it was kind of dirty, and in some shots we'd have up to 50 million dust fibers. Represented as RI curves, we could follow Woody as he walks behind this cabinet here. He's walking by cobwebs, dust bunnies, uh, dust, it's kind of gross back there, and all this stuff happens completely automatically in your own home. <laughs> In, in CG, it's much more complicated, and later on, we're going to have some folks talking about that uh, length uh, specifically from Pixar. Another fun fact, Soli, our friend Soli, uh, 2001, he was really cool. He was hit. He had 2.3 million hairs, also represented by R.I. Curves. And now today, in 2019, the dust in Toy Story 4 is way more complicated than he is. Sorry, guy. <laughs> if you go outside the antique mall and walk around, there's a bunch of trees. And if you count the leaves on the trees and you stop when you've counted them all, you'll have counted over 6.7 billion leaves. I guess they're thriving. <laughs> Seems pretty complicated until you decide you want to count all the pine needles on the trees. There's a lot of pine needles. There's actually over one trillion pine needles on the, on the trees. And um, to you, that might seem a little insane. But at Pixar, we prefer to call it reality challenged. And uh, that's exactly what the complexity at Pixar is what we do, is you build these complex worlds, and we use RenderMan and have toned it and optimized it to render all this stuff. So, um, so that brings me to the final fun fact, or should I say not so fun fact, because in the whole Toy Story 4, there is not a single Utah teapot. <laughs> I know, I couldn't believe it myself. And I, I think we had the technology to render it, because if we go back to the original Toy Story, there's a Utah teapot. There wasn't any problem rendering a Utah teapot back then during the Miss Nesbitt scene of Toy Story. And um, so I thought tonight, we could try and uh, fix this oversight in Toy Story 4. With, 
was the walking teapot Bo Peep could love. And that teapot is behind door number one. <laughs> and uh, should I open door number one? Yeah. Sure, why not? <laughs> Uh, it is the Miss Nesbitt teapot, <laughs> and we, we have those for, for some of you. Unfortunately, sorry, we don't have them for all of you tonight. You're going to have to settle for the teapot behind door number two. So now, whenever you want, you can have a little caffeinated buzz. <laughs> So you're all going to get teapots. Which one will you get? How should I know? I don't know. I don't know. So we fixed the teapot problem. Now let's look at kind of our traditional animation pipeline at Pixar and where we're kind of taking that and how that's evolving at our studio. So traditionally, we'd have pre-production just shovel stuff into modeling. It would go to layout, lighting, rendering out. In the end, would be a, a movie. It was very linear, right? And there was, uh, as far as departments go, there's like cross-departmental collaboration, things like that. But um, even today, we still have what I refer to as the VFX Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have the folks in modeling that have been doing it for 50 or 60 years. You have like people that have really deep knowledge about very specific domains and they might not talk to the people in shading or lighting or rendering and nobody talks to the people in rendering they don't get any sleep so <laughs> so we, we wanted to move uh, you know towards uh, something that's more collaborative more interactive and less siloed so last year we talked a little bit about uh, live action <laughs> sets and some of the techniques that we use from uh, live action photography and film on Incredibles 2, we want to start using more of that technology that allows us to collaborate more efficiently and work more interactively. So we're doubling down on two technologies at Pixar, and we're doubling down on USD and RenderMan, heavy-duty stuff. And that allows us to do things that, that in ways that we couldn't do before and transform our pipeline. So let's look at USD. USD allows us to do a lot of things. It's not just a file format. At, US, at Pixar, we use USD to represent all the objects in our antique warehouse. The USD team is here. We have a couple pods. You can check them out. They're using, uh, they're optimizing USD to make it as fast as possible. We're using non-destructive workflows with concepts like variance and opinions. And critically, they're helping collaboration. So if we have a giant set like the antique warehouse, we can have a subset, and that subset allows us to have people from multiple departments work on the same scene. So a layout artist can lay, do layout, an animator can do animation, a modeler and lighter can do their own thing uh, while everybody's working on the same thing because we have these scenes, schemas, things called schemas and layers. So. This works really great for production because it allows us to bring people together and work on stuff. And USD is becoming easier to implement. So it used to be you have to build a lot of stuff around uh, your pipeline to get USD integrated in it. And there's a bunch of announcements that are coming up that are going to make it work more out of box, such as um, the recent release of RenderMan and, and uh, USD. We have a new RenderMan Hydra Delegate. So over here we can see. Uh, over here, we can see the OpenGL delegate. This is a new RenderMan Hydra delegate. So you can open up USD view and see your pixels coming from RenderMan just by selecting RenderMan as a renderer. We also have announcements uh, such as command line rendering of USD. Autodesk is talking about uh, basically um, unifying all the my USD plugins from Animal Logic, from Luma, pictures and Pixar into one open source repository. Foundry is working on similar uh, strategies to ship USD plugins for Katana and Nuke, followed by Mari. And of course, SideFX has announced Solaris, which will have a foundational USD uh, as part of the platform. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on right now in USD. 
And if you want to check it out, you can talk to the folks in the USD pods. They're having a great SIGGRAPH, so let's give the USD folks a uh, little applause. And we also have uh, XPU, and we have a little update on XPU for you all. And it's a research and development project. We're still plotting away on it in, in big ways. We're making a lot of progress. And here is an asset, the antique small from Toy Story 4, being rendered in the R&D version of XPU. There's a lot of data that's being pushed around here, but before I break that down very much, I wanted to point out that the XPU project is intended to replace RenderMan and become an entirely self-contained renderer. So it's going to be able to omnivorously consume a GPU or a CPU as needed and required by a certain scene on working on the same image. This particular shot is the antique mall. It has one environment light outside, and the light that you see bouncing around inside is actually three bounces of illumination coming from this environment light. We have simple shaders in the scene, but we're really impressed with how much performance we're getting out of XPU. And we're achieving lots of milestones. So we're, we're encapsulating lots of different types of data now, from, from curves to points. We can render lots of textures. And finally, uh, we have other milestones as far as shading and lighting goes. So we have many milestones before our, um, our developers can sleep well at night. But we're working really hard at making a next generation renderer and this is a long plan and we're we're really excited to to share it with you we have an xpu pod over there that you can check out after the presentation and ask any questions that you'd like renderman today we have a special announcement we have a new renderman challenge so this is our renderman challenge if you haven't seen our challenges we invite people to light shade and texture these scenes and submit them to a competition, and then the best uh, the best uh, entry wins. If uh, if you if you win, you can impress your friends. If you don't have any friends, <laughs> you can buy them with over twenty three thousand dollars of prizes. <laughs> we have some great sponsors that that helped us out with that. So uh, we're we're excited about that. I'm gonna. I'm going to plug free non-commercial RenderMan. So if you want to join the challenge, try out RenderMan. Uh, we have a non-commercial RenderMan. You can use it with this generous EULA. And uh, you might as well try non-commercial RenderMan. As I say, it's not going to try itself. <laughs> so some of our latest updates include since uh, 22 last year, we've, we've, in our dot releases, we've really like piled on a bunch of interesting stuff this year. So we've, we've made RenderMan more interactive and faster, and we have a couple big initiatives, including the, our collaboration with Intel to accelerate uh, OSL, and also a complete rewrite of our RenderMan for Houdini plugin to uh, to take all the benefits of RenderMan 22. And yeah, it's it's a pretty nice a pretty nice upgrade. And more info on this. All the pods have have stuff that's relevant to to this sort of thing. <laughs> RenderMan 22.6, that was just released last week or uh, weeks ago. We have a new uh, Pixar curvature pattern in this dot release, so you don't have to beat yourself up trying to beat up your shaders. We have a uh, new RenderMan for Mari, so we have a, a GLSL shader that's real-time that emulates the Pixar surface shader which is a surface shader that we use in production at Pixar and that we also ship with RenderMan. That's now emulated Mari. And we also have the RenderMan.HydroDelegate that I was talking about earlier. So a pretty nice release uh, that also has more stuff because who doesn't like more stuff, right? Um, so our major announcement that we're announcing at SIGGRAPH this year is uh, after version 22, Shock Horror, RenderMan 23. So, that's unbelievable, I know. And RenderMan 23 is going to have Houdini 18 support for Solaris and USD, and we're planning to deliver that for it to drop on day one of uh, Houdini 18. So we're working really close with side effects on that. Command Line USD, 
you can write uh, render USD files from the command line with render man. We have IPR improvements and API and platform updates for uh, the developers out there that want to make tools that are integrated with render man and more. And this is all coming in the fourth quarter of this year. And if you'd like to know more about our APIs, uh, the feature showcase pod has folks that can talk to those points as well. So that brings me to the most exciting point of uh, this demo or present presentation is the live demo. So can we switch over to the to this live demo? I'm going to demo both RenderMan for Maya and Houdini because I'm crazy. <laughs> and uh, I just want to show a little bit of the interactivity here. I have an IPR section running inside of Maya. And this is this is basically <coughs> Random Man for Maya with, with Random Man running in it. And this is an inclusion integrator. We can make it a little bit more interesting by switching our integrator from just running occlusion calculations to render, rendering uh, full path tracing. So I'll swap that out here. And now I'm rendering some, some path tracing, which is, which is pretty nice, but maybe Maybe we'd like uh, one bounce of global illumination here. So I'll add one bounce of global illumination, get a little more detail there. And just to point out, this is Duke Kaboom from Toy Story 4. We've taken the same shading networks, converted them over to RenderMan for Maya, so it works with the off-the-shelf software. And if I zoom into the car exhaust, uh, the, the bike exhaust here, you can see that there's really a lot of data in these textures. So we haven't dumbed the textures down. These are like 4K and 8K textures that we're uh, feeding into these, this, this shading network here. Not as complicated as the, the full Pixar shading network, but still a shading network. And I'll zoom out here to this shot and show you a couple things that I can do in my IPR session. I'll select part of my network zoom in there and I have a Pixar very known and I'll close down my globals here and hop over to my attribute editor I have a Pixar very node on my motorcycle so this is my motorcycle shader and if I start changing some of these Pixar very nodes it's going to start adding randomness to different parts of the bike based on their their object names. So now we have different colors on the bike because I've changed uh, the random seed for these different things that Pixar varies, like just putting it on, putting on different colors based on the object name. I can go to my displacement shader, and this is one thing that we couldn't do until um, until 22.5 came out. So this is new from last year, but I can take my displacement shader here, and I can make the bike a little puffy. <laughs> um, so I, I found that displacement is something that you can use to make things look puffier. Uh, so I can dial that down a little bit and it's, it's not quite as puffy. can make it probably more puffy <laughs> than, than it really needs to be. But, you know, uh, I can dial it down when the boss walks by and be like, well, it's just a normal bike. <laughs> so I can zoom out here, and we can see that I did a little bit of a look dev workflow. I can also grab some of these things. This is like a light filter, and I've selected my light filter. And by increasing the, the density of my light filter, I can create a spotlight effect and then I can make the spotlight a little bit bigger because the filter is affecting the areas around it. If I invert the effect, you can see that the light goes outside it, and then I re-invert it, and light goes inside it. I also have another kind of cool filter if I can find it here. I don't recommend working at a workstation with big spotlights shining in your face. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's harder to to do things, but I'll increase the density here. And what I have is a ramp that you can see this ramp right here. Yeah. So I can move this, these little nodes in this ramp and kind of craft the lighting in my scene in real time, check that out. So that's great. So this is great for looked up. It's great for uh, lighting. 
and also something that I can do in 22 that we couldn't do on Toy Story 4 because it was rendered in Render Man 22 or 21 is, let me see, I will turn off the selection highlighting and now I can just simply say, well, maybe Duke should be going over a bigger jump. Maybe that would make it more dramatic. So I can just try that out, that idea. Um, maybe the director comes by and says, you're crazy, so we'll make that smaller again. So those are some kind of fun workflows in, in Random Man for Maya, but let's say I wanted to take this into Random Man for Houdini and make it maybe more dramatic than just making the book feeder bigger. Well, I have this thing over here called the Preset Browser, and the Preset Browser allows me to take all the shaders that are attached to Duke, save them out into this little section here, and save out Duke as an Alembic, and then I can open up Houdini. So I'm going to do that right now. Close out Maya, and I hope this computer doesn't blow up. Let's see. Okay, so here's, here's Duke in Houdini. We have a little, uh, a little simulation running behind him. Looks like uh, some confetti stuff. And over here you can see the preset browser. So this is the same preset browser, and it's pointing the same location that I had my Render Man for Maya pointing at. And here are the same shaders from Duke Kaboom. So all I did was import the Alembic and then attach those shaders, and then I get this, this answer from it. I can kind of kind of look around here. Let's see, I'm starting up my session, hopefully. And this is the best thing about my demos. Okay, I'm getting some pixels in here. So we're getting the pixels come in. So the first time you start up a session, it puts a lot of stuff into memory, so it takes a little bit. And then I have a pretty fast interactive session. And that's kind of dramatic, but what if we want more drama? Well, is this enough drama for you? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that seems pretty dramatic. Um, but unfortunately, our legal uh, department said that we can't burn up Duke Kaboom. So um, I can take this VDB file and turn it off during my, my, um, my, uh, my IPR session if I'm really concerned about that. But it's SIGGRAPH, I'm not really. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just turn that back on. And so I have my IPR session. I'll send it off to the render farm. And then I'll show you the final result as far as um, what the final animation looks like. So if we can switch back over to the, the laptop. Here we have Duke Kaboom. We have the fire, and he's going to jump right through that hoop. So if you're ready for it, here we go. <laughs> that, that always worked in rehearsal. So in closing, I just wanted to say that we're, we're excited to be here sharing all the developments that we have, uh, like the, the near-term stuff with 23, the, the far-term far plan with uh, XPU, and a lot of the exciting stuff that's happening in the industry with USD. So uh, with that, in closing, I would like to say uh, the future is coming. So thank you. <laughs>